One of the first things I did on the Jag was to install the electric motor. This meant figuring out the suspension in the rear. I was reusing all the control arms, but the springs and dampers were too big to fit under the Jag, so I went with some coilovers. By the time I got to the front, I had decided that I wanted to use air suspension, so I got airbags up there. They're basically coilovers, but instead of a coil spring, it has the airbag over the shock. So, bag overs? Rubber overs? There's probably a word for these. But I never got around to putting in the rest of the system, so I just had to occasionally go out with my air compressor and add to the front suspension so it wasn't all stanced out. But now, it's time. It's time to add the air compressor and tank. Time to put the bags over the rear shocks. Time to design a custom low-cost control system from junkyard parts, and then to just buy an off-the-shelf system and install that instead. Air suspension is not the best suspension. At high ride heights, your air springs are full of air and really stiff. At low ride heights, there is little air pressure and your suspension is super soft. This is the opposite of what you want. This car has a decent amount of ground clearance and a pretty good approach and departure angle, but it has an atrocious breakover angle. Imagine driving into an elevated parking lot with a gentle slope up. At the top, there will be a pointy bit, and that pointy bit will gently tickle the underside of my car. By gently tickle, I mean aggressively damage, and by underside, I mean the high voltage battery. This is bad, and exacerbated by the fact that I have bolts going all the way through the battery holding my seats in. I will cut this bolt off, but it will still stick out a bit. Fun design note here, this bolt is threaded downwards so that it's not sticking up through my carpet and it squishes the floor down when you tighten it. So I need the bolt to be a little bit longer to start threading it, then I have to go under the car and cut it short. So every time I have to remove this seat frame, I have to buy a new bolt. Is there a better solution? Probably. Is this solution good enough? Definitely. This poor breakover angle became clear when I was trying to get the car onto the trailer when I moved. The trailer has this pointy bit here and my car couldn't make it over that. I had to jack up the rear of the car and shove some spacers under the tire and it still gouged the bottom of my frame. Air suspension will fix this problem and any parking lot issues with a flip of a switch. Also, it looks cooler when it's lowered. Yeah. I already had a compressor sitting in my garage. I bought one for my Forerunner, and they were selling two compressors for the price as one compressor, so I just bought two. So I got an air tank and installed both of them. The compressor needs to be isolated on rubber feet to keep the sound from transmitting into the car. I made a platform for the tank and the compressor and isolated the whole platform. This sort of makes the tank vibrate with the compressor, making it a giant sound resonator and completely eliminating any benefit from isolating the compressor in the first place. This was pretty dumb on my part, and especially annoying in an electric car, because it's all nice and quiet until the compressor comes on, and then... So, I will be moving the compressor somewhere else in the car, or maybe here, possibly back here, and I will be putting it in a box with a fan and some of that extra dynamat I have lying around, but that is future Matt's problem, because present Matt has a functioning compressor, and that's good enough. As I said, I have the air springs in the front already, but not the rear. Both are from Ride Tech, and the only difference between the coilovers and the uh, rubber overs is the airbag. So I ordered two of them and swapped out the springs. That was easy, except there is one issue. When I mounted the subframe in the rear, I mounted it lower than it would normally sit in the Tesla, so the suspension is always compressed a little bit more than it's designed to be. I did this because I needed to fit enough structure into the frame to keep it stiff and strong. The suspension has five links. The big fat bottom one down here usually holds the coil spring and the damper, but since my spring and damper are integrated, it just kind of now sits awkwardly and unnecessarily large. Anyway, there's five of them, and they each have a rubber bushing on both ends. A five-link system like this would be over-constrained if not for these rubber bushings. As the suspension moves up, it adds camber to the tire, but it also starts binding because all those bushings are squished or stretched too much. So even if you have no springs at all, the suspension still won't travel any farther. The fix for this is to modify one of the links. In this case, the upper link needs to be a little bit longer. Even if I didn't have this binding problem, I'd need to lengthen this link. Since the suspension is compressed more than it normally is, it has more camber than it's supposed to. You can adjust this, but not enough. I thought I might also have to modify the front upper link as well, but I talked with some people who have lowered their Teslas, and it's not necessary. Anyway, how do I lengthen this link, and how much do I need to lengthen it by? The answer to both of these questions is to make it adjustable. All I need to do is add a thread on one end and a female thread on the other end, throw a jam nut in the middle, and call it good. 
I could have added a turnbuckle with opposite threads on both sides. This would make adjusting a lot easier, but I like to keep things simple. By the way, you can buy these, but I decided to save some money. I used a pretty substantial bolt here, 5 eighths of an inch. I lathed it down, slid it onto the tube, and welded it in. For the other side, I got some 1 inch thick wall tube and tapped one end for the 5 eighths thread. The other side I drilled out and slid over the existing control arm. I had this tube go all the way to the end and I left the bolt long enough to go all the way inside its tube. I did this because I wanted to make sure these tubes don't break. Since they have rubber bushings on each end, once you clamp the bolts down there is a bending load that changes as you sweep through the suspension. And since I have a larger suspension swing with the air set up, it will see lots of weird loads. Plus it would super suck to have one bend or break going around a mountain corner, so it's beefy. Beefcake. Beefcake indeed. I decided to extend the DIY theme to the control system. I have an air compressor and a tank, and I have airbags. Now I just need something to tell where the air to go and how much of it to go there. We'll need a solenoid block to control the airflow. There are lots of off-the-shelf systems for this, but there are also a lot of cars in the junkyard that have air suspension. It seems that a lot, if not most of these cars, use the same solenoid block made by Continental. You can get them for about 50 bucks on eBay. There are also a lot of knockoff blocks that are probably not as good. But how do they work? What do the wires do? Well, I prodded it with a multimeter and found out. Five of these wires have 44 ohms of resistance between each of them, but they each have 22 ohms of resistance between this sixth wire. So that tells me that this sixth wire is probably a common 12 volt, and the other five probably each open one of the solenoids. There are six tubes coming out of this, but only five solenoids because one is an input. I threw 12 volts at the common and ground at each one of these wires and figured out which one activates which solenoid. I also tried 5 volts, but that's not enough. It needs to be 12 volts. There are three other wires, and they go to the pressure sensor inside the solenoid block. I took a wild guess and assumed that the red was 5 volts, the brown was ground, and the blue striped one was signal, and I was right. I hooked up a Schrader valve to the block and tested the output at different pressures. Graphing the output, we find that the pressure gauge is linear, with 0 psi being 0 volts and 120 psi being 2 volts. For those of you in metric land, that's 0 kPa equals 0 gargaflargs, and 830 kPa equals 200 megaflargs. Cool. So now we just have to design a control system. The simplest way to do this is to have four switches and four gauges, but this is a little too analog. I don't want to be pushing four different buttons and looking at gauges every time I want to change ride heights. We need a smart system. We will have three buttons that equal three different right heights. When we press one of the buttons, the system will look at the pressure on each corner and inflate or deflate that corner to reach its target pressure. Easy enough, but this valve block can't inflate and deflate at the same time, so if we have three corners that need inflated and one that needs deflated, we'll have to inflate the three first, then deflate the last one afterward. But then if we inflate three to their targets and then deflate the fourth one, we might have to go back and deflate one or more of the original springs since they might now be too high, but that change might affect the others, so we might have to do it again. This valve block only has five valves, and we kind of need eight. We need an inflate and a deflate for each corner, so let's use two of these. We can check the pressure for each corner using the integrated pressure sensor. We can just close the inlet and then open the valve for one corner to read that pressure. Then we can do the same for all the other corners. But this becomes a problem since we need to kind of constantly be checking all the pressures as we adjust things, so we'll need pressure sensors for all four corners. Of course the easier solution is to just use ride height sensors. Most of these junkyard cars with air suspension have these and they're all basically the same. You throw 5 volts and ground at it and it spits back a voltage between 0 and 5 depending on what ride height that corner is at. So when you press a button that system looks at each corner height and adds or subtracts air pressure to get it to the right height. I could design and build this system, but it will require testing and tuning and developing, and it was about this time that I looked around the garage and realized that I have about 20 half-finished projects going on, several on the Jag alone. I've got that land speed car, and that season starts real soon. I'm trying to get a new engine for the S600 for the Peterson Japanese car cruise in. I need to rewire my Grom. I gotta finish whatever this thing is. I don't really have the time to debug a system that gets stuck at its lowest setting or decides to randomly do three-wheel motion at highway speeds, so I decided to solve this problem the old-fashioned way. With money. I went with the Ride Tech system since I'm using their shocks and airbags and also their lower control arms and I'm happy with all their stuff. You can buy a whole prepackaged system, but I already have the compressor and the tank, so I just got the valve block, the controller, the ride height sensors, and the wiring. I drew up a simple bracket with a couple of bends and had my friends over at Send Cut Send laser it out for me. Worked great, except I put the tab in the wrong place, so I had to cut it off and re-weld it. I bolted that to the car and ran all the wires and hoses to their respective corners. I added the ride height sensors, attaching the rears to the sway bar link and the fronts to the upper control arms. And that's about it. I have air suspension. Works great.
I am currently limited on my lowering. I have bump stops in the front, but I can move those up and get another inch or so out up there. In the rear, I'm contacting the frame with the front upper link. This is not good, but Tesla uses a different link on the Model Y, which I should be able to swap in and get another inch or two out of the rear. And then I can be that guy high centering my car on a speed bump. So yeah, save myself a lot of time, which is good because I have way too many projects going on right now. But now you know there's an easy way, and there's a cheap way. And if you want a simple system with switches, you can do it pretty inexpensively. And if you want the junkyard system, you can do that too. I did most of the work. All you have to do is write the code, install it, make a video, and take all the credit. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm.